Faith, family, freedom, hope, and opportunity. You're listening to Freedom Rings. I'm your host, Senator Marsha Blackburn. And thank you for joining us for Freedom Rings. I know many of you want to hear the stories of people who are living out their freedom every single day. And today, our guest is someone who lives it out not only in song, but in deed. And we are just so thrilled to to bring Jeffrey Steele to our Freedom Rings audience and He is such a well-known songwriter, writing hits, big names, a member of the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame, which is a really big deal in the music industry. And uh, Jeffrey, of course, having freedom enables you to do this. And I know songwriters always have a story that they're writing a song about. So what are some of your most impactful moments in the music industry that you, when you think about, I can't believe I'm free and able to do this crazy creative job. What are some of your favorite memories? Well, I mean, I always, I always tell people, I feel like I'm, you're fooling everybody because I, I, I we're in a country where I'm allowed to do a My job title is songwriter. I mean, would you just think about that? It it just makes me laugh. I'm a professional dreamer. I get to make stuff and and write the truth in my heart that I know. Um, Over the years, you know, I've been doing this for about and had a lot of success, but I have worked very hard at it. It's it's easy for a successful songwriter make, to make things look easy, but it is a very difficult job, and 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 you know how how tough this business is. It's a weeding out process. Those who really want it the most work the hardest, stay the longest. Um, many many people in this industry become very independent thinkers because they have to figure out ways to win the game. So one I think one of my favorite moments is most recently with Aaron Lewis because I've written a song over the years. I've had a little bit of controversy seen some of my songs but this one has really created a you know real polarizing event within the industry for me people that are kind of bummed out that i wrote it and people that are very excited that somebody finally said something to the world um so i I would say over the years that one there's been a few like the song my wish that i wrote for rascal flats was a life-changing song for me not just as a successful hit but just how it's affected people's lives Um, and and the impact that's had around the world. So I've learned a lot from from being a professional stuff maker upper, as I call myself. (laughs) I love that. You know, I tell people all the time, the great thing about this country is we talk a lot about the American dream, and freedom allows everybody to pursue their version of the American dream. So yours is being a professional dreamer. So there you go. Absolutely. Yes. Now, uh, you grew up in Burbank, Mm -hmm. and your dad worked in the steel industry. So talk about the impact that had on your life. Well, my dad, my dad was a, he wanted to be a songwriter. And and he was drafted into the Army into World War II as a paratrooper when he got out of the war. And I was the youngest of the five kids. And I grew up in basically a senator. I grew up in Hollywood, California in the seventies playing in a lot of rock and roll bands. And my dad kept telling me, he said, you need to listen to country music. And I I kept telling him, my dad, I just don't like country music. And I finally got a Merle Haggard record and I fell in love. And that be kind of, it kind of became my, my music was like the seventies rock and roll upbringing. And then this Merle Haggard storytelling that I learned. So I was playing the clubs and the bars and, you know, just kind of make making my way and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I worked part time for my dad and he fired me. And I it's my famous story. I said, Dad, you can't fire me. I'm your son. He goes, you're going to cut your fingers off working in this shop and you need to go play that guitar. And I got really mad at him. I got so mad at him. And I was gone on the road traveling around for a couple of years. He got really sick. I'm making the story short, but he passed away and I was even more mad at him because I missed so much time with him at the end. And then one night, about 20 years later, I'm standing on a stage songwriter of the year with Chris Christopherson, mm-hmm. one of the guys he told me to listen to. And I'm, I'm getting awarded the songwriter of the year. And I'm just looking up into heaven going, thank you, dad. You know, yeah. thank you, dad, for, for, for 
making me think and figure it out for myself and, and, and realizing that I have something that I need ability for me to chase that gift, you know, even, even more than just, you know, a dream. I thought it was a responsibility for me to do that. And that's kind of how I look at the songwriting process. It's a, it's a responsibility, you know? I'm telling you, that is, uh, that is really quite remarkable. But isn't it true that sometimes <laughs> there are people that know better what we need than we know what we need ourselves? And let's talk about three of those songs, Afghanistan, and stick that in your country song. And of course, <laughs> am I the only one? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those are what you call message songs. <laughs> oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and you know, and, and not to interrupt, uh, Senator, but in the past, I have written songs like My Town and Hell Yes, yeah, Something to Be Proud of, <laughs> uh, Raise Them Up, songs that are very patriotic, but it was in a different time. When that was okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was okay to love your country and shout it. <laughs> yeah. So so people people are saying, I can't believe you're writing all these these crazy it, why are you writing songs like this? I said, I've always written songs like this. Just now the times are a lot different. So, yes. you know, it, it's a different impact. So anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt there. <laughs> no, I think that those are three great songs. And as I said, they're message songs. They mean a lot to people. So talk a little bit yeah. about your journey on those three songs. Okay, let, I'll start with uh, in order of, uh, of, of their uh, release. So I actually wrote a well, writer that I wrote it with, with a guy that was right, a young kid in Nashville. And he's a young kid and he came in one day and he had a terrible right. He was working with some new artists that really didn't know what they wanted to do. And he came in and he was just complaining up and down about the state of the world and the state of the music business. Write something with some meat on it and stick it in a country song. And I looked at him. I said, what did you say? And he said, somebody needs to stick it in a country song. I said, we got to write that right now. You know, and I started thinking about as a lyricist, you know, I started thinking about what that meant to me in today's world right now. And keep in mind, Senator, this was 2000. Uh, 14, 15, right around 2015, yeah. when we wrote the song. So it was a different time in the world, but there was a lot of stuff going on. And um, we wrote this song, not in protest, but like we were just tired of hearing the same, just everything was fluff on the radio. Yeah. And so I, st I, finished, I finished a demo recording of it and I started playing it for all my artist friends and you know publishers and industry people I knew. And they they looked at me like I had, you know, two heads and I was the cr I was a crazy man. You, you can't sing something like this in country music. And then I, I'm, I'm condensing the story. But about five years later, you know, the world's on fire and pe people are tearing down statues and burning things down. And and I get a call from Eric Church and he said, hey, I just heard this song you wrote called Stick That in Your Country Song. He goes, I'm going to put this out. Um, he goes, I think there's no better time for the world to hear a song yeah. like this. So honestly, I had kind of given up on the song and thought nobody would really record it. Um, and then Eric found it and he he looking at the state of the world, he goes, I'm just going to put this out and see what happens. And it, it had a lot of impact. Yes, <laughs> you know? I think that that is fair to say it has had an impact because people relate to it. But, you know, Jeffrey, I tell people all the time that I, one of the reason I am such a fan of songwriters and a fan of yours is you can tell somebody's life story in three mm -hmm. minutes. And when you take a song, like stick it in a country song, you can build out this picture, this mental picture for somebody. They can imagine themselves saying this, singing it, agreeing with it. Because yeah. it speaks to them. And I think with Am I the Only One, that's exactly what happened with that song. Yeah. And I think that, um, I, I, you know, I always, always try to tell the younger songwriters, you know, the important thing is not to, not to try to write what's on the radio, but write. you got to write what's in your heart. If you're with, you're with a recording artist, you got to try to write what's in their heart. And so that's always been my kind of M.O. when I walk into a room, Senator. And, and um, I 
got a call from Aaron Lewis to, to come over and, and get together with him to try to write a song for his, his new album. He needed one more song. And it's, what's crazy about it is it was only just this past April when I wrote the song. Usually for me, it's like years and years go by before somebody finds it, you know? So it was this April and, and Aaron had a song for my fans and Aaron has a pretty rabid conservative base um, that follows him. So my premise was not to try to write a hit song. It was just to try to write something that would really touch Aaron's fans uh, in a live setting. And he started walked out backyard and started walking around his yard. And I started looking at my phone at some of my old songs and old song titles. And I stumbled on this title that, you know, am I the only one? And I was looking at it and I'm just staring at it. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Am I the only one? you know, that feels this way? Am I, am I the only, only one here tonight at this show that feels like the world's falling apart? Am I the only one, you know, th that's watching TV and 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 want to scream at it and throw things at it? Am I the only one that's looking around and reading all this information and going out of my mind? So I walked back in the house. I said, Aaron, I think I got it. <laughs> I think I got it. And I explained that to him and his, his eyes just lit up and he goes, that's it. That's it. Yeah. And we wrote it. And then he started playing a lot of shows and that's risk. And people started freaking out. It started to blow up. The record company got involved and said, hey, we have to put this out. So here's the funny part. <laughs> this is the craziest part. The song gets released right before the 4th of July, which is perfect timing. And it, it, it's on these. So this song went to number one. His cat had no country radio airplay from the radio station because they won't play it. They're afraid of it. Yeah. And Facebook, of course, and YouTube are canceling it all over the place despite all that, despite all the promotion that could possibly go, you, you know how the, how the business yeah. works and all the promotion that goes into a record. Um, yeah. Without any of that, it's the number one song in the nation. And people wanted to hear yes. it. And it's just started to go viral and, and blow up. And it's still to this day, uh, three months later, it's still in the top 10 in, um, in sales and uh, it won't go away and it's not going to go away. <laughs> no, you're right. It is not going to go away. Because and people... I will tell you, the reason is because it's all about freedom. And <laughs> it's all about it's... loving this country. And the tens of millions of Americans that identify with that. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. And for those of you that are watching our podcast, Freedom Rings, you can learn more about Jeffrey Steele. On Twitter, it's still music. And on Facebook, they still have him on. They haven't canceled him for good. It is Jeffrey Still Music. <laughs> I'm still <And> here. <laughs> he is still hanging in there. The Still Man. You can't get rid of him. Jeffrey the Still. The Still Man is still hanging in. The Still Man is still hanging in. I mean, <laughs> and we could say that for all of these workers that are out there that are getting canceled out by the this vaccine Absolutely. mandate. They are still hanging in. Well, listen, uh, you have been a fantastic guest. I am so grateful to you. I'm such a fan. And to be able to have this conversation with you today, you, what a gift, what a pleasure. And thank you for continuing to inspire us and keep writing those hit records. Love hearing them. Thanks so much. And Thanks for watching Freedom Rings. Thank you for listening to this episode of Freedom Rings. You can follow me on Twitter at Vote Marsha, Facebook at Marsha Blackburn for Senate, and on Instagram at Team Marsha. And you can always find us online at MarshaBlackburn.com. The Freedom Rings podcast is edited and produced by Jared Cummings. Executive producers are Conservative Partnership Center and Marsha Blackburn. Together, we make Freedom Rings.